Arthur Halley Compton has an effect named after him because of the experimental work he did and the theoretical work he did in order to explain the, his findings. The so-called Compton effect is another example of a, a breakdown of where classical wave theory of electromagnetic radiation is insufficient to explain a particular apparatus, apparatus and its experimental findings. So we're going to look at the Compton effect and why it mandates uh, the use of the photon or a particle description of electromagnetic radiation. If we try to tell the story of light scattering off of electrons classically, we might assume uh, that an electron vat exists and we're going to say we're going to choose that electron vat to be just a bunch of atoms. Electrons are pretty loosely bound to an atom so they almost act like they're free. They're available to be pulled out and scattered around it as you wish. Classically, if you shine light or an electronic uh, wave at this thing, it consists of E fields and B fields. And so what would happen? The electron would see the E field from the traveling wave and start jiggling up and down because of that electric field that's accelerating it up and down. The accelerating charge itself emits electromagnetic radiation in all different directions. That's because of an accelerating charge is known to, to emit uh, electromagnetic waves. All these steps occur at the same frequency because at the, with the same frequency that the light, the light is modulating at the location of the electron, well that's the frequency the, the electron is going to be jiggling up and down. That's also going to be the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation that it radiates off in different directions. Classically then, we would predict that light scatters off of an electron and is re-radiated in different directions at the same wavelength or frequency as its incident. Well, the quantum theory of light scattering off of an electron is going to be considerably different. If we use the photon model of electromagnetic radiation, we have to view the light as an incident on a stationary electron as it being a particle. The photon strikes the stationary electron, and the electron is given a kinetic energy, kicking it off to the side in some direction by an angle of phi. The photon's a billiard ball, so it's going to scatter in some direction theta, and the only thing that tells us about what direction theta is going to be is that we have to conserve momentum overall. If we have zero momentum in the vertical direction initially, we have to have zero net momentum in the vertically at the end of this collision process as well. Now the photon gave some of its kinetic energy to the electron, so now it has less kinetic energy available for itself. That means in terms of wavelength, the photon has a longer wavelength after the collision. We think back to de Broglie's hypothesis about uh, momentum is h over lambda. Well, if it's got now a lower momentum, it must have a longer lambda. And in fact, Compton was able to derive a formula that was a prediction. The wavelength final after this scattering takes place is going to be related to the initial wavelength, lambda i, and there's going to be a difference between these two given by Planck's constant times c over the electron mass times c squared times 1 minus the cosine of the angle of the scattered photon. That is to say, if the photon scatters at 0 degrees, in other words, it keeps going straight forward, well, theta is 0 and cosine theta is 1, and the right-hand side of this equation is 0. There's no wavelength shift. The photon is just basically plowed on through. But if theta is large, 90 degrees, for example, well, then cosine of theta is 0, and 1 minus cosine theta is now just 1. And the wavelength after the collision is going to be considerably different from the wavelength before the collision. If the photon actually scatters the backward direction and theta is 180 degrees, well, then the cosine of theta is minus 1. And the thing in the parenthesis on the right-hand side is here is actually 2. So the wavelength after the collision can be considerably different than it was before the collision, and that's something that Compton was able to derive and then go and experimentally measure. We're going to look at how he was able to derive this formula and then some of his experimental measurements that confirmed his prediction.